On this episode of the Ask Mike Reinald Show, we talk about scapular winging and if it's always a negative thing to have scapular dyskinesis. The Ask Mike Reinald Show. Helping people feel better, move better, and perform better. Before we get to the podcast, I wanted to make sure you knew about my free online course on the introduction to performance therapy and training. If you want to learn how to get started optimizing and enhancing performance, this is the course for you. Head to MikeReynolds.com slash performance to sign up today. Welcome back, everybody, to the latest episode of the Ask Mike Reynolds Show. We're here answering your questions. Keep asking them, MikeReynolds.com. Click on that podcast link, and we'll answer as many as we can. Keep them coming. Anything you want to talk about, PT, sports performance, fitness, career advice, anything you want to talk about, let us know. We're here for you. Speaking of who's here for you, I'm joined here by Dave Tilly. Hi, Dave. Hi. Maybe we should all say hi. We should do that today. Mike Scaduto. I am here for you. <laughs> this is like roll call. I feel like this is a, this is Zoom, Zoom remote learning during COVID that we all did. Dan Pope, Lenny McCrina, Lisa Russell, Present. all here, <laughs> here, all here answering your questions. Len, who do we have today asking questions? We have uh, one, one student, one student today. Um, he's been just grinding for weeks now by himself, just grinding, grinding, for weeks upon end uh trevor lotion the lotion clarige clarige from belmont university in nashville tennessee trevor clarige trevor is clarige. your mom gonna watch the podcast today? <laughs> <laughs> what's that i think you're muted probably not no okay whoa should we take offense to that wow. yeah i think or so she, i mean um, Katie, she's Katie used to Stone. <laughs> you think Katie Stone's mom still watches the podcast? I, th- I think she's subscribed because I'll yes. still get a text text from Katie about it all the time that mom approved this week's episode. <laughs> so, shout, out, shout out to Katie's mom. Hi, Katie's mom. Yep. Awesome. Man, I'm, not sure, I'm not sure if my mom could figure out how to, to get to a podcast to watch it. So, I guess okay. Got I don't blame her. Mom. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't blame her. That's good. That's good. All right. Um, or what do we get for a question today, Trevor? So Isabel from Illinois, uh, is there a difference between having flexible shoulder blades and having scapular dyskinesis? Can you have shoulder blades that stick out during certain movements and not necessarily have winged shoulder blades? I like that question. The first thing I thought of was a, a literally a scapula that could like bend like a cartilage one, yes. flexible, flexible shoulder blades. Like a shark fin. Like that. That, yeah, that sounds terrible. <laughs> uh, Isabel, I, I know that's not what you were asking, but my brain did go there for a second. So um, I think that's a great question, right? Because we always think that there's like this established norm, like there's one type of person out there, right? So we even see this in sport, sport mechanical things where somebody's like, oh, I don't like the way their scaps are moving. And I'm like, well, I mean, for you, that would be excessive motion of their scapula. But for them, that's not excessive motion, right? They have a ton of motion in their scapula. So we see this all the time with people where either their resting posture, their scaps are sitting a little off, right? Or maybe dynamic posture, there's like, you know, a lot of movement and, and, you know, and winging going on. So I guess the real question here isn't like, how do we label that? I guess the real question is, is when do we, I don't even think we're going to say, when does that become pathological? Because I don't think that's the right answer is when does that become suboptimal? Is there such thing as just having excessive mobility? and not being like dyskinesis meaning like we need to fix it is there ever a time you don't fix it so who wants to start it's a good one uh wow yeah you, I mean, wow <laughs> curveball josh you got no no josh isabel isabel threw us a curveball isabel. now and <laughs> what's up dave lenny can lead the dance step <laughs> yeah i mean I, I i don't know i think we're walking a fine line just the way you, things were labeled um in that question um, leads me to believe like I, I need to either redefine how I'm looking at the scapula or we as a profession need to redefine how we're looking at the scapula. I think we get so caught up with like the minute details of especially the scapula. It's like weird how like scapula dyskinesia can have all these different definitions and how we can somehow 
apply it to that person that's in front of us. I think we just need to be very careful with some of that stuff sometimes because we can really freak somebody out by saying that, you know, they have winging causing all this. And sometimes winging does like you, you can, you get somebody who normally had a, a normally sitting shoulder blade and all of a sudden they show up like this. I mean, to me, that's something going on. I had a few baseball players over the years that just randomly showed up with like, you know, a winging scapula and that's not normal for them. So that would, to me, would be pathological and we need to address that. But somebody who maybe has it, but when they get up into a throwing position, it corrects. Um, I'm not as concerned with that. And so people get caught up because they've seen previous healthcare providers, doctors, PTs, athletic trainers, anybody um, that have kind of gotten in their head with that. And I, it's up to me to figure out, does this truly correlate with their symptoms and their dysfunction? Um, or can we just kind of educate, get through it and figure out what is what are the true causes of their, of their, of their issue? You know, so it's yeah. tough to say I'm being vague, but um, <laughs> yeah, I, I just, I get, I, I get, I get, I don't know. You get caught up with d- these different terms and it can be, it can be detrimental for the person. So I'd be careful. Yeah. What's up, Dan? What do you think? Uh, I agree. And I think the big thing is that, you know, we're not really sure if dyskinesia is bad. Is it normal? Is it okay to have this? And the research is very mixed and more recent research shows maybe it's not as important as we once thought. Right. Um, can, I jump, can I jump in right there too? Because this is, this is the narrative on, on, on the internet again. And, and I want to still jump in right here. You're never going to be able to conduct a research study. This, that is the most broad question is does dyskinesis ca- you know, cause pain? That is a, a really unrealistic research study that makes no sense. And I'm just going to jump in and still just say here, I, 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 suboptimal is not okay for me. Right. So I just, I wanted to leave it right there. Everybody wants to argue that. Does this even mean it? Yeah. It doesn't lead to injury, but that doesn't mean you're optimal. Right. And there's, there's a lot of negatives of that. So, sorry. So, so, so based on that, Dan, like keep going, but like, man, I, I, I hate how everybody's trying to say that, like, you know, it, you know, don't worry about anything. Like, I mean, I think we're yeah. definitely putting yeah. people in disadvantageous positions. So sorry. I got up. Yeah. I kind of see it as like, you know, if you're a physician, you get crapped on all the time because you're just addressing these diseases with like a pill or something. Right. And then people are crapping on it because they want to optimize help health. I think that um, oftentimes physical therapy, that's the same thing. We can probably tweak that movement to make them better at a given sport. Right. We're definitely sports providers. Um, I guess what I was going to say is that it just gives you a little extra information about the shoulder blade, right? And kind of Lenny talked about this before. If you're moving a lot from the shoulder blade on one side, you know, why is that happening? I mean, I see this all the time in people that have shoulder pain or they have shoulder stiffness with either the capsule, right? Or maybe the teres major. And if I have an overhead athlete that needs to have as much overhead mobility as possible to perform a snatch or just more than they have currently, and I see a lot of upward rotation on one side, one of the first things I start thinking is like, okay, this person is limited overhead, but they're moving a ton from the shoulder blade. What's going on within that shoulder joint? Is the teres major stiff? Should we start working on that? Um, and it also really depends on the person, right? So if I have like a, let's say a a six-year-old woman that comes in with shoulder pain and she's got a little extra upper rotation and she doesn't necessarily need a ton of mobility, uh, maybe I'll go on that the same pathway of, okay, well, maybe we need more motion within the joint, um, but maybe we don't. So I guess it, it really comes down to the person, gives us more information, and we can start our clinical reasoning from there. I like that. And I think you both, like Lenny and Dan, you both kind of said it here. It's it's almost like what's happening at the scapula may be a clue that that there's something else that we need to look at, which is which is great. Is it a, is it a nerve? Is it a weakness? Is it the shoulder joint? Is it the thoracic spine? Like what it is? It's like it's almost like right. that's the result. So I was gonna say, just remember the scapula is just kind of sitting there, it's just floating. It's influenced by everything around it, the thoracic spine, the muscles that attach there. There's so many different influences um, to it. So just blame the nerves, which we're talking like a long thoracic nerve thing. So the scapula is just kind of this like floating bone that is, is looking for direction. So, yeah. What do you think, Dave? Yeah, I just think like the the scapula dyskinesis and then also, you know, like patellar tracking are two of the most kind of, you know, frequent victims of this is that like as PTs, we oftentimes want to have an answer. We want to find something that's wrong. We want to, you know, make it work and find something that's going to help the person. It's with well intentions, but like so many times I've made this mistake and I see other younger clinicians make that. It's like they immediately jump to the thing right in front of them. And it's like, Oh, and you know, it's just a winging scap. That's why your shoulder hurts. Case closed. Let's do some exercises. Right. And like, <laughs> it's a much more complicated system <laughs> than that. I think yeah. oftentimes we look for the biomechanical thing right in front of us, but like, there's so many other things that probably are way more important to think about. Like Lenny said, like maybe they've always had wing scaps. Like maybe, you know, they've always had an issue with the way that their knees it's anatomical, but 
they had a 400% spike in their workload recently, or like, you know, they're doing something new or they're trying some new skills, or they just haven't been doing their strength conditioning program and their cuffs getting a little bit weak and they're just you know, sore from that. So I think it's, it's hard sometimes because it means you really got to check your own biases about like what you think the answer might be and what you want the answer to be, because you took this new course over the last few weeks and you want to use the material. But I think sometimes you got to be really careful about being like, all right, there's a lot of things that could possibly be, let's not jump to conclusions. And everybody in this call works with some people who are like really hypermobile, have some crazy anatomical, you know, unique things about throwing or whatever else that they probably wouldn't be a great athlete if they didn't have them. So like, I see a lot of people with gymnasts with crazy wing scaps and like crazy hypermobility. And they're like, no, I feel great. I feel fine. It's like, okay. <laughs> I, I think, you know, I'm re reflecting now. And I think that really was helpful because I, I can't, um, I can't remember the last time I actually thought that this was somebody's problem. Right. I, now don't get me wrong. So s some scapular movement issues, right. So we'll call that dyskinesis or whatever you want to call it. Um, I, I oftentimes think that's part of their suboptimal checklist that I create for the person, but I almost all, I almost never think that it's their, it's their number one problem and it's their thing that's causing the pathology. It's just part of the equation sometimes. Mm. Um, I like that. So, uh, Lisa, you get a little bit. Yeah. Um, I mean, I feel like I, in learning from you all over the past year plus, I, all of these things for shoulders is something that I've like completely changed how I look at shoulders. Like, I feel like I like the person asking this question. I feel like I used to look at just like positioning and, and whatever, and just be like, Oh my gosh, like, here you go. I found your problem. Um, yeah. and, and I feel like knowing, learning from you all, like, you know, more sports specific aspects and just like different ways to look at how things move and, 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 everything we've talked about has really changed my outlook on shoulders. Um, and, and something really cool that I kind of just had an aha sort of this week was, um, a, a rower that I had the opportunity to work with. She had like no shoulder pain, but just like watching how she was rowing was like, my goodness, you're just like not using that shoulder, like scap positioning connection. Well, like you're not optimizing that piece of your stroke at all. And through the winter she did, a ton of shoulder strength work. And now I just got to go on the water and watch her row yesterday. And it's like an incredibly different picture. She had no pain to begin with, but now her stroke is so much more connected and so much more powerful because we found, you know, that, that non-optimal function of her shoulder, not necessarily like pain driven. And, um, you know, I feel like it's, you know, she, she hasn't necessarily changed how her shoulder blade sits. Right. But like the, right. Way she, she, did. she, it she, so she didn't change her rib cage right like yeah, her rib yeah, cage yeah. is still the same right. rib cage yeah. same bones um right. so you know i just i feel like shoulders are way more complicated in that way there's not like one way to just like stare at somebody's back and <laughs> go um and yeah i don't know it's just it's a it's a really cool different outlook on on how it all works to not think like just a wing scap means bad things yeah. And, and I think I would end it with this too. And kind of summarizing, Dave mentioned this, everybody kind of mentioned this, Lisa mentioned this a little bit too, just because somebody has the ability to wing their shoulders. So I think that's what a little bit with Isabel's kind of like saying is like, they have the ability to wing their shoulders. I've had patients sit there and they can go like this. And then all of a sudden it's this gigantic, you know, crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Tilly could probably do that. We may have to prove that too. We're going to get a video of Dave's scapula and Mike's uh, subluxing perineal Here. tendons. Yeah, uh, do it right now. Yeah. <laughs> but like, like, like just because you can wing, as long as it's not winging during your functional activity. Right. Cause again, think about it. Like, I don't want to be the person that says your winging isn't necessarily bad for you. If I'm a baseball pitcher and I get my arm up to this position and it does this, this changes everything about my shoulder position. So I don't, I'm not going to say that's bad, but I'm sure as hell not going to say that I don't care about that. Right. That's very short sighted. Right. So for me, I think it's, it's okay if you can move them and wing them as as long as functionally when you're doing activities, they don't wing. I think that's the key to it. That's the control of it. If somebody is just a mess and they just can't do that, there's you start thinking neurological and, 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 you know, deeper types of pathologies that may be happening. But I think the key for me is that some people have excessive mobility in their scapula. It's all about just, can they stabilize it during their functional activity? So think of it that way, right? I don't think we've labeled anybody as a diagnosis of scapular dyskinesis 
as long as we've had champion, right? That's never been anybody's diagnosis, right? So kind of keep that in mind. So good question, Isabel. Hopefully that helps. If you have a question like that, please um, head to micron.com, click on that podcast link, fill out the form to ask us questions and be sure to subscribe, rate and review us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and we'll see you in the next episode. Thanks again.